Hello, folks. Welcome. My name is Alice Hutchinson. I'm the owner of Bird's Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I'm honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers in readings and conversations each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Right America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the unifying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, essays, and poems, we recognize one another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger Rosenblatt, the creator of Right America, puts it this way, writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So with that, I welcome you as several of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other and with you in an effort to bring us together. We will wind up this spectacular two-year run at the end of this month with the last two additional episodes on Tuesdays. If you missed our last episode with Paisley Rectal and Carlos Fonseca, you can go to Bird's Books Write America page and link to the episode easily. All of our recordings are now on our Write America YouTube channel for you to watch at any time. Tonight's episode is also being recorded, so if you miss something, you can go back and rewatch. The link is right on the front page of our website. Tonight, we are hosting readings by and conversations with Priya Jane and Ann Perez. I will return at the end after readings and discussion to bring your questions and comments to the authors. During the episode, please feel free to make comments or ask questions in the chat. We do ask that you remain muted, however. Our first speaker is Priya Jane. Priya Jane is a journalist and writer whose essays and reportage have appeared in the New York Times Book Review, O, oh, The Oprah Magazine, Slate, Salon, Bust, and other publications. Her creative work has received support from the Southampton Writers Conference, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and Tin House. She lives in Brooklyn, New York, where she is currently at work on a narrative nonfiction history of her great-grandfather's role in the Indian independence movement. Please welcome to the screen, Priya Jane. Hi, Alice, thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, thanks, Alice. Uh, thank you, Roger, uh, once again for this just putting together this incredible series. I'm so grateful to be a part of it. Um, and uh, so sad that's coming to an end, but I'm thrilled to be reading uh, with you again one last time. Um, so I thought I would read tonight from a novel that I've been working on. Um, I read the first chapter of this novel uh, on Write America uh, last year. And so I thought I'd read a little bit of the second chapter just for fun. Um, so the novel um, concerns um, an Indian American mother who lives in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, named Leah Rye, Leah Rye Jackson, since her marriage. Um, she's a children's book author and a mother of two. Um, she lost her parents when she was 17 years old in a uh, terrible car crash. Um, and her parents left her and her little sister, Jazzy, a mysterious map that they cannot decode and it's covered with strange symbols. And um, Leia, uh, this is very like a very classic, if you're familiar with uh, adventure stories or hero's journeys, it's a very classic call to adventure. Um, and Leia turns her back on this call to adventure and decides to move on with her life, you know, pick up the pieces from her life from this tragedy and try to move forward as best she can. Um, whereas Jazzy really wants to uh, find out what the map is about and she spends the next 15 years looking for clues that might help uh, her figure out why her parents left them this map. And so when the novel opens, it is the morning after Thanksgiving, 15 years after their parents' death, and Jazzy is calling Leah to tell her that she has found a clue that proves the map is real. And that clue is that carved into a tree in the woods behind the house, of the family house that Leah now lives in with her husband and kids uh, is the symbol that starts at the be beginning of the map. 
And so the sisters go out and see the tree uh, and Leia sees for herself this symbol carved into this tree behind her house. And when chapter two opens, they are walking back to the house um, after seeing this. The night Nikhil and Parvati Rai died, there was a lightning storm. When the first bolt lit up the sky, Leia was in her room sulking. She was supposed to be at a costume party and she lay on her bed in her black leotard, imagining herself slinking about the house with the kid whose parents were either out of town or didn't care. She couldn't remember now which it was. The sexiest of the sexy cats, tail twitching, whiskers waving, while the heads of all the popular boys whom she didn't really want but whom she desperately wanted to want her, turned at long last in her direction. Some nameless wavy haired jock had just opened his mouth to ask her out when the magnesian crack of the lightning made her jump off her bed and she'd gone downstairs to check on her sister who was watching TV. And the two of them huddled under a blanket together as the windows lit up and Leia felt a strange shame as though her fantasy had come too true. And now a million paparazzi were outside their house, flash bulbs popping. You'd be careful what you wish for sort of feeling. Then it stopped and the air was quiet and Leia fell asleep under the blanket until a loud knock at the door startled her awake. It wasn't that night, but the morning two, three months later, Leia was thinking about it. she and Jazzy tromped back through the woods to her house so she could change her shoes and tell her husband what was going on. A hazy winter morning when the estate attorney charged with executing their parents' will had come with a lockbox. It had not happened at this house, the Rye family house that the house of their parents' friend, Dimple, who had become the girl's guardian. The girls who had been living in the spare room sat on the sofa across the coffee table from the attorney who waited stiffed back on one of two lacquered chairs which usually rested against the wall, but which were now pushed forward for company. Leia still remembered stray details. The haze, the white circles and the beige carpet left behind by the chair's displaced legs, even as she'd forgotten entirely the estate attorney's name and his face, which appeared in her memory as a brown smudge, a vanishing. His hands, though, she remembered, long and hairy knuckled, not unlike her father's, clean and well-clipped fingers reaching into the box, which was big enough to hold lots of things, but which in the end contained only two slips of paper, a deed, a map. She remembered feeling crushed, just absolutely crushed. There was no other word for it. It was as, it was as if her chest had crumbled in on itself, all vestiges of hope hope that she could actually do this, that she at the age of 17 could navigate her own life and her sister's life forward into the unknown forever lost. That hope had been keeping her going in the most basic of ways, showering, dressing, eating, showing up for school just often enough to elicit sympathy from her teachers so they wouldn't force her to repeat the year. She felt herself standing on the cusp between childhood and adulthood, and she believed she could cross the chasm if only someone or something would extend a hand from the other side fairy godmother, perhaps, or barring that, a handbook, the kind she could find on the kitchen table in a rental house with all of the information on the lights and the boiler and who to call if the basement flooded. Had she really expected that exactly, a three-ring binder containing her parents' pin numbers and the make and model of the stove? Maybe, maybe not. But when the attorney pulled out nothing that resembled it, she felt its loss. As Leah walked behind Jazzy through the woods back to the house, she remembered her 17-year-old self, so utterly crushed, turning to her little sister, the one person with whom she'd truly been able to share her grief. And instead of finding her own devastation mirrored back at her, she found the 12-year-old sitting next to her was thrilled. It was true Jazzy was so much younger. She felt the loss of their parents differently. She was missing not only a hand over a chasm, but half a childhood of nurturing. And so Leia could have been more sympathetic. She could have realized that in holding the map, Jazzy was holding the possibility, fantastical though it may have been, that their parents' deaths contained some meaning. As the estate attorney droned on, Jazzy had whispered to her, treasure and mystery, secrets and messages from beyond the grave. Leah couldn't remember exactly what. She was obliterated in the moment by something she experienced, not so much as a name of a feeling, but a sense of blackness. A new chasm opening, this one between her sister and herself, Tectonic plates shifted, and she was no longer sitting next to Jazzy, but floating free. She could jump back toward her sister into the realm of childhood by believing in the map, or she could leap to the other side, extended hand or not, into adulthood. 
After the estate attorney left, Leah drove back to her parents' house, which would officially become hers on her 18th birthday, unlocked the door, and went straight up to the attic, where she found the photo album and stuck the map in the back of it. She had intended to leave it there forever, but over the following 15 years, she had had occasion to pull it out to contemplate it anew. Had some part of her ever wanted it to be true that the map was real? Maybe. Possibly. But she couldn't, wouldn't believe. When Leah pushed open the front door, she was greeted with the clamor of a household fully awake. Clanging dishes, running feet, the murmur of a television she was sure no one was watching. She slipped off her coat and slippers, leaving Jazzy to deal with the laces on her own boots, threaded her way through the living room, which indeed was empty, save for the PBS kids characters hunting dinosaurs on screen, and into the kitchen, where she encountered the entire family in the act of cleaning up and concurrently making a new mess. <clears throat> David looked up from the sink, his hands covered in suds. Hey, he said cheerfully, what happened to you? Jazzy showed up. David made his yikes face, eyes wide, teeth bared into a forced smile. Leah wasn't sure if the yikes was for her or her sister. She's here, she continued, and how long have you guys been up? The girls were behind David, making, from the look and smell of things, pancakes, which is to say Zora was making pancakes and Mira was whining she wanted to help. Okay, pour the flour in there then, her oldest daughter was saying. No, not like that. Damn it, Mira. Zor, language, David said. And then to Leah, I don't know, half an hour. They slept in, but that doesn't seem to have improved anyone's mood. She settled up next to her husband, who radiated a calm she could not feel. Her phone was on the counter next to him. You weren't worried when you woke up and I wasn't here? He leaned sideways and kissed the top of her head. I figured you took a walk or something. My phone was here, she protested. What if she'd been kidnapped or hurt? Hey guys, Jazzy patted in, shut up her boots. It's Jazz, so good to see you, David said. Girls, look who's here. Mossy, Mira squealed and ran out from behind the counter to tackle Jazzy. Sora, on the other hand, cracked the last egg into her batter and carefully wiped her hands on a towel before coming out to offer her aunt a weak arm tug. Hey, Mossy, she said. Happy Thanksgiving. Guilt pulled at Leia's stomach. Zora had once had the same uncomplicated enthusiasm for her aunt as Mira, but after Jazzy had failed to show up for Zora's ninth birthday party that summer, she had become more wary of her. Leah had half-heartedly explained that Jazzy often worked weekends, but Zora hadn't bought it. Now Leah chided herself for not having tried harder. She needed to do a better job of protecting her kids, their hearts. Hi, babies, Jazzy said, giving her nieces a squeeze. I've missed you so much. What are you making? Pancakes, Mira shouted. Mira always shouted. Oh, yum, can I have some? I'm starving. Zora frowned but nodded, and the girls, one gingerly and the other with blunt force enthusiasm, folded their aunt into their cooking project. Leah moved towards the living room, beckoning David to follow. He cocked an eyebrow and nodded. I see you, give me a sec, and she went in to wait. In the time she'd been away with Jazzy, the living room had fully transformed from dark and silent to bright and blaring, blankets and errant stuffies strewn on the ground, as though not a half hour, but several had passed, and not two children, but an entire parade had trundled through. She silenced the television with a click of the remote, folded the blankets, kicked the stuffies into a corner. On one side of the room stood a bookshelf, a mahogany behemoth, which David had made for her as a wedding present. She reshelved some of the children's books that had been pulled down and left open on the floor and walked her fingers up to the shelf that contained her own books. She rubbed her thumb along her name and the thin red spine of one of them, The Talismanic Act That Gave Her Comfort, by L.R. Jackson, the row of them read, a reminder that life had turned out pretty okay. She pulled one of her books off the shelf and sat down on the couch with it. She wouldn't be like Jazzy and call it destiny, fate. She recoiled at the implication that her parents' death had been necessary for her, for her success, but it was also true that if her parents had lived, she would have gone off to college somewhere in New England and then who knows what. She had had a vague intent to study history like her mother, but often said that those who poked into the deepest corners of the historical record, rather than simply memorize the birth and death dates of so-called great men, would unlock the key to saving the world. Leah did not intend to save the world. She did not think such a thing was possible, but she did find the idea of sitting in a quiet library, cross-referencing several weighty tomes appealing. 
instead of matriculating at one of those colleges with wood paneled libraries and dust motes floating in the sunlight, she had commuted downtown to the unromantic campus of Georgia State and there had met David. She had also taken a creative writing class and written down the bedtime stories her mother used to tell her because in her grief, it was all she could think to do. And though she turned in the stories agnostically, expecting to be chided for not writing about couples breaking up and friends groups coming apart like everyone else in the class, it turned out the professor knew an editor of small press who was in the market for children's fables. And just like that, her future had unfolded before her. Author, wife, mother. No, despite the constant gaping hole of grief, her life wasn't going badly at all. I'm gonna stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Priya. Our next speaker is Ann Peretz. Ann Peretz is a family therapist who while working in two housing projects in the mid 1980s, founded a program now known as Parenting Journey to assist struggling families who lack the necessary resources to face great cha challenges. With a talented team, she created innovative techniques and therapeutic interventions, which were successful enough to be taught to a wider audience. Parenting Journey expanded its training program and carefully crafted, crafted curricula to over 500 locations, reaching thousands of family and several thousand facilitators in the United States, Burundi, and Guatemala. Peretz has received awards and distinctions from prestigious organizations such as the Alliance for Mentally Ill of Massachusetts, Phillips Brooks Housing Association, Harvard University, On the Rise, Inc., and from the cities of Somerville and Cambridge. Please welcome to the screen, Anne Peretz. And I'm going to ask you to unmute. There you go. You just need to unmute, dear. Unmute myself. Okay. Am I ready to go? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. I'm um, going to read um, about two families uh, that represent the kind of families and the family situations that our organization uh, works with and um, you'll get a sense of what it is, hopefully. Walking through the scratched and battered steel door into Colleen's apartment felt like, the, like entering an abandoned prison. I was there because of an unusual and inverted complaint that had been lodged with the housing authority by Colleen against her children for parent abuse. My organization, a family therapy nonprofit called the Family Center had been asked to follow up on this odd complaint. Colleen was a 27 year old white woman, poor and very overweight. She lived in a, in a low income housing development with her two children, 10 year old Jimmy and eight year old Mara. Inside her apartment, I found amidst, amidst a, toy, a, a tornado of toys, papers, old food, clothes, filthy bedding and mattresses angled off the beds. In the middle of it stood the perplexed mother while her two pale children, their eyes glassy and bored, twitched as they fiddled with peanut butter sandwiches on the living room floor. The television was blaring in comp competition with another equally loud TV in a different room. Colleen start, uh, started talking the moment I came in, even before I was through the door. Without so much as a how do you do or any introduction at all, she began shouting at, at me about the children. How, how the children were hitting her, yelling at her, and how they would not clean up the apartment. This was the parent abuse she had complained about. I expected to encounter an initial awkward silence, wariness, and a period when I would have to earn at least a modicum of trust before we would, could get started with our purpose, if there was one, for this visit. But this, like the complaint itself, turned on its head. Colleen talked and talked. There was no room for me or the children to enter the conversation. Finally, she sat down, she talked and I listened until I stopped listening and just watched the television while she went on. The children were quiet. Were they perhaps interested in me? Maybe they saw a hope in what looked like a hopeless situation or maybe I was just the next installment in a string of false hopes that had preceded me. Was I catching the disease, believing there was nothing that could be done here? I thought to myself, I should say something. 
Surely there was something to say, but there was nowhere to put in a sentence. The atmosphere was enveloped by Colleen talking and the televisions blaring. When a commercial came on, a, a man selling a vacuum cleaner, Colleen's attention turned to the screen and she started talking back to the salesman as if he were a friend, a familiar figure with, with whom she was accustomed to having a dialogue. He asked, do you want your home to look like this? Pointing to a sparkling, clean, freshly vacuumed room. Yes, Colleen told him, she did. She didn't miss a peep. It was all one story. The salesman's story, her story, the story of her apartment and her children. It was the story of a woman completely overwhelmed with her life, unable to separate one thing from another with nowhere to turn and desperate to find her way out. I couldn't find a thing to say to reassure her. I had no strategy to offer, no place to begin, not even a word of hope. I had been quickly and effectively inducted into the drama going on in Colleen's space, not knowing where to turn, I had never felt so helpless. I left feeling like a complete failure, thinking, how did I get myself so quickly disabled in one short hour? My first thought was, I can't do this, even though at that point I didn't know what the this was. I wasn't a neophyte. I had a social work degree and 12 years of private family therapy practice. I had worked with troubled, overstressed, traumatized women before. I had conducted a therapy, therapy groups. But with Colleen, I felt like I was facing the first day of my social work field placement. I had to, to somehow find my voice and communicate to a desperate person needing to unload her burden without having the slightest sense that anyone could do anything about it. Hers was not so much a cry for help, it was just a cry. My next visit started much as the first, but this time I was determined to engage the kids as well. Jimmy was a skinny little kid with hair sticking straight up, wearing a shirt that looked like he'd had it on all week. He was jumping nervously around, anticipating what I might say to him. Could this child really be a threat to his mother? He was guarded. It was hard to tell. Mara was even more guarded, looking suddenly down, sullenly down at her feet. Colleen ordered Jimmy to clean up his room and gave him one garbage bag to do it. I wondered to myself what was supposed to go into the bag, garbage, dirty clothes, or things he might want to save. I suggested I'd go to try to help him, but I didn't ask the critical question. What was the bag for? When we got into his room, there was the same chaos and urine smelling mattress and endless objects lying about, French fries mixed up with broken toys and pieces of clothing. Without any prelude, Jimmy asked me to get into his closet with him. I had no idea why he wanted me in his closet. It seemed unrelated to cleaning up the room, but he was determined. We got in, the closet was very small and it had no door. He scrunched down on one side and I scrunched down on the other. I asked him if he was able to find things in his room. Did he know where everything was? Did he have an idea of how we could get started? We sat in there for a few moments in silence. Then he said to me, there are only two things I can't find. His tone was serious. I looked at his face. Then he said, love and friendship. What 10 year old would say such a thing or could say such a thing? We stayed in the closet for a few minutes. I put my hand on his, he was quiet. When we got out of the closet and returned to Colleen, she demanded to know why Jimmy wasn't cleaning the room. She raised her voice and he began to shout back. I suggested to Colleen that maybe Jimmy was a little overwhelmed and needed a hug. She gave me a puzzled look. Why should I give him a hug? She said, nobody ever hugged me. He doesn't need a hug, I never, I never hug him. Jimmy was now at full throttle, throttle. I waited a few minutes and tried again. I think Jimmy might quiet down if I put him in a squeeze box. I had just made up this term. I threw my arms around him in a pretty strong clench, intended to look to Colleen like a kind of punishing restraint, but which, to, which felt to Jimmy like, well, a hug. He calmed right down. In my next visit, 
With some reluctance, Colleen learned how to use the squeeze box. At first, she looked extremely awkward, but eventually she, both she and Jimmy seemed to able to do it pretty well. Colleen wasn't ready for the soft emotional feelings of a gentle hug, but she could understand power and control and a strong restrictive embrace. It was a start. Maybe we could build on this. As I walked out of the projects that day, I knew that this was going to be my life's work, taking a different approach, finding what is working in the family and amplifying it with exercises and interventions which provide hope and possibility. So that's story number one. Billy on the roof. Billy was up on the roof of his school, threatening to jump. Police and firemen arrived, ladders were raised, and a net was put in place. Kids in the street were laughing, taunting him, encouraging him, admiring him. They wanted to see him jump. Some were scared, some teary, some possibly envious. This was not a normal school day. Billy was African-American, 13 years old, not particularly good at school, and like most of his friends, kind of a goof off. He liked to wear bag baggy pants and long colored shirts and cut his hair short in the popular flat top style. He could be boisterous, but recently he had become distracted and glum, sitting at his desk and staring into space. He had also been, exper been experiencing fits of rage, picking fights and swearing at friends, even at teachers. He was sent to a therapist who diagnosed him as suffering from bipolar disorder. Billy resisted going to this therapy, to these therapy sessions, and when he did, didn't get much benefit from them. So finally, a meeting was arranged for, for Billy to meet a therapist at the family center where his sister was already in a group. Crystal, the therapist, asked that the whole family come in for, initial, for an initial session. Seeing the entire family, made sense to everyone. Vicki, his mother, brought her four children, Billy, his 10-year-old sister, Isa, eight-year-old sister, Latasha, and baby, Tonya, to the family center. Crystal began the session by asking everyone to imagine that they were artists and to take turns making a picture of how they saw their family. She explained that instead of using paper and pencils, everyone would agree to be a piece of clay that, would, that could be molded by a sculptor. Each family member would take turns being a sculptor who would then use the other family members as the raw materials to create the picture. Crystal explained that there were three rules to making the sculpture. Vertical distance shows power, horizontal distance, which show emotional closeness or distance, and facial expressions and gestures with arms and legs would express the type of emotions that being felt. The sculptor could arrange other family members any way he or she wanted. In this way, they could all see how each of them view, viewed the family. The family was intrigued by this novel game and was willing to participate. Billy agreed to go first. Crystal asked Billy to place his family members in relation to each other according to these rules. And lastly, to place himself in the picture as well. She also gave him a life-size doll that he could use to represent anyone outside the family whom he thought might be important. Billy took the assignment seriously and tried different positions. He, had sit, he, he finally had Isa sit on the floor with a sad, resigned expression. He had her cross her arms in front of her. Latasha was on the floor beside her. His mother was in front of the girls with her head turned away. When Crystal encouraged him to show more, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, Billy put himself closest to his sisters, but a long distance away from, from and standing. His expression was angry. When Crystal encouraged him, to show more of that anger, Billy put up his fists in a kind of helpless gesture. Then Crystal, Crystal asked him if anyone was missing. He grabbed the life-size doll and stuffed it between his mother and Isa. He said this was his mother's boyfriend. He was clearly agitated. 
then Kristen, Crystal asked after a few moments of silence, Billy, can you tell us, can you show us a picture of how you would like your family to be? He leapt up, grabbed the doll, threw it on the floor and started pummeling it, screaming at it with almost animal sounds. After this, the other family members were clearly shaken by Billy's performance, made rather innocuous calcified family sculptures. They were covering something up and fearful, frozen by Billy's revelation of an unspoken family secret. Isa looked particularly scared and upset. The next day in a meeting with Isa and Vicky, Crystal slowly helped her tell her story. It came out that she was being sexually abused by Vicky's boyfriend. Isa was terrified of the boyfriend who had threatened to kill her if she told anybody. And she was scared that her mother would, might not believe her and might be angry at her for telling the story. Crystal promised to make, to, to make sure that, that the boyfriend would, that, that she would have the boyfriend arrested and he would go to jail. Then uh, Isa, and, and then she helped Isa and her mother have a conversation. Vicky was very angry at Isa. She didn't want to believe her and, then, and told them it wasn't true. Isa's knuckles were digging into a pillow on the couch. She looked away, tears dripping down her face. Crystal said to Vicky, look at your daughter. Do you think she's making this up? Vicky glanced at Isa and looked away. No, Crystal said, look at your daughter. What do you see? Do you see someone lying? Or do you see someone suffering and scared and not being cared for by her mother? Well, Vicky said me meekly, I didn't know. Crystal went and sat next to Vicky as a comforting gesture saying, I'm at your side, but she didn't let her off the hook. She was challenging her from up close. After, after this meeting, they returned to focus on getting the whole family back together and to address Billy's feelings and behavior. He was silently treated as a sort of hero. He had shown all of us, his family and the therapist, what was really, what was really going on in the family. In the meetings that followed, Billy's Billy story emerged. Billy was a vulnerable kid wanting to find a safe place with a family he could trust, which he was he could which he could not find at home. As a result, he was ideal prey for the youth gangs who were, prowl were prowling the neighborhood. He had been approached by some slightly older boys who asked him to join them. They were well known in the neighborhood as trouble. Billy wanted to belong to something, but he did not really want to join a gang. He just wanted a good friend whose family he might be able to go home to. But the older boys were persistent and felt and he felt trapped, caught between his family, where he could not tell, where he could not tell the truth, and protecting his sister, and the gang, which was both tempting and intimidating. One day, things came to a head. A boy from the gang told him that he was either with them or against him. Them, he had to decide that day. Billy's response was to go up on the roof and threaten to jump off. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Hi, Anne. <laughs> wow, that was powerful. So that's that's my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was listening to you, and I'm trying to. I was I was struck by a couple of things um, in those stories. I mean, they're both very, very powerful stories. Um. I was struck in the Colleen story about uh, the idea that you, I think it was, you said it was, it was I going to succumb to the disease of thinking that nothing could be done. That this idea that it was like a disease that you could, you know, that it was like an illness that could take hold of you um, was very, very powerful. Um, that kind of apathy um, that, or cynicism maybe would be a better word for it. That, that, um, that, that, threatened to take hold of you. And then in the Billy story, um, 
the crystal, the therapist sitting down next to the mom and saying, you know, I'm by your side, not as like a comfort, but as like, I'm going to challenge you from up close, mm -hmm. uh, really just a very striking posture. Um, I, I, I just really enjoyed the way that you use those kinds of details to tell the story. They're really instructive and I think very fascinating. So. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And I was very moved by your story. I got a little confused with all the, all the girls. <laughs> um, and partly that's because I have a little hearing problem, but um, it, it's really fascinating to me how you, you really bring in a kind of historical dimension to something. And yet it's really, there's so much about family. I mean, what, what struck me is there's so much about mothers and children and the role of mothers and, and are the children really being taken care of the way they want to be are they doing what they what they i don't know it, it just it, it it struck me as oh i want to read more about this <laughs> thank <I'll>, you <laughs> so i will Good. that's the that's the hope i mean <laughs> um, um yeah i mean I, we were chatting a little bit before this um and as i mentioned you know obviously my um characters are not as in as in dire straits as you were Mm -hmm. um, as you were as your subjects and patients um so a whole different level of parenting um but i think that anxiety right that as you said that we're we're all doing it <laughs> wrong <laughs> right and we all make mistakes and we all get <laughs> and we all get hit for it one way or another yeah. um, you know but it's it's very hard and you know women trying to be something more than just mothers mm -hmm. is an incredible challenge. And um, I think that's something that's going on right now and it's, an, it's an important thing for it to be going on. But um, I think whatever class, nationality, economic group, whatever, you know, that these, these issues, they take different forms and they look different, but it's all something about relationships mm -hmm. and um, and you know how how we can manage to have a life mm -hmm. and also to really look after what needs looking after and, and, and are looking after our families. And our, our approach is different than most people because we really try to um, we try to use humor a lot for one thing. Mm -hmm. we try to get people to laugh. We have funny interventions they're very and 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 very active interventions rather than talking therapy and we don't we we don't diagnose people uh we have the interventions we we work in groups and um people find out a lot about themselves and each other by kind of getting over the sort of defensiveness of being you know, labeled with something and thought to be a certain way. And when when we treat them as respectfully and and find these different kinds of inventions. I, so one of our first interventions is when, when people first start in these groups, uh, we have a, bu a, a bunch of buttons that are sitting on a table and the buttons have funny sayings on them. So, which could pertain to family or whatever, but not not necessarily directly. So. And we ask people to just come in and pick a look at the buttons and just pick one that interests them and stick it, put it on. We don't give any reason. And then, and that is one of the ways that they introduce themselves, because then they introduce themselves by their name and they and then we say, Why did you pick this button? You know, so one of them is, you know, um, it takes does it does it, it it takes more than 40 years to become a parent, to become a parent. And one is queen of the bad girls and you know just sort of funny things that people can relate to and tell stories and you learn so much about people's lives that way rather than you know trying to go right in and mm -hmm. you know find the pathology and we don't look for pathology we look for, we we believe that everyone has strengths and these strengths get hidden and and sort of destroyed by you know by trauma traumatic experiences, almost everybody experiences these traumas and um, and just 
you know, trying to get through and, 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 and so both social traumas and personal traumas. Um, so that's really what our approach is and that's what the book is about. Um, it's really, I, I'm curious about, um, I mentioned to you before this that um, uh, my mother is a family therapist and does similar work in Atlanta uh, or has some similar work in Atlanta. And uh, I know she's always wanted to write a book yeah. uh, about her parenting philosophy. And, and I think one of the challenges has always been like, how do you structure that? How do you contain all this experience and all these ideas and all these people that you've met and all of the stuff that you've seen and all the different ways of sort of looking at parenting and how do you encapsulate that in a book? And I'm curious how you tackled that. Well, <laughs> over a long period of time, you know, I had stories, I wrote stories. And I have to say, Roger Rosenblatt, who's an old friend of mine, I gave it to him and he really liked it. I mean, what I had there, he said, come down, I'll help you. Because I said, I don't, I don't know how to write a book. I've never written a book in my life. So I went down and spent a weekend with him <laughs> and um, he just, he kind of zipped it up and, you know, cut it down and made it funny. And every conversation I ever have with Roger is funny. Yes. I mean, people walk yes. into my house and they hear me on the phone and they say, oh, she's talking to Roger. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's a little bit, there's a lot of Roger in this book in a way. I mean, he, he, not about the families themselves, but sort of how to, you know, how to present them in a way that kind of expresses, you know, some kind of sense of who these people are. And then, and then a, a lot of the books is what we do with them, but I, I didn't have time to do a, write about that, but we do have these very interesting interventions and um, hopefully we can make a dent. That's great. I love that. <laughs> I think everybody needs a Roger to just zip, zip, zip and, you know, yeah, right, right. No, he's great at it. <laughs> so, anyway, so I'm I'm looking to see if I had. I I, I had some questions, but I I don't think I can get them out right. So, but I'm I'm very interested in in the topic also. Who is your great great grandfather? Oh, so um, right. So I should have updated my bio. Sorry about that, Alice. But um, uh, I I am working. I I have been working. Um, uh, or I have two books that I've been both trying to uh, get out there and also continuing to tinker with. Um, and one is a, a nonfiction book um, about my great grandfathers. Um, and um, they were my maternal great grandma, grand, great grandfathers, whoo, excuse me. Um, and one was an editor, a newspaper editor um, of a very prominent newspaper editor um, on the side of the freedom fighters during the Indian independence movement in the uh, early part of the 20th century. And um, he uh, was one of the first Indians to be in government also. And he had um, ideas for how the country should become independent and how it should move forward that frankly lost. Um, he didn't win, his, his ideas did not win. Um, Gandhi and you know the more kind of, kind of uh, uh, passionate freedom movements um, kind of took over. And my other great grandfather was a um, an agricultural scientist. Wow! And he uh, did a lot of uh, work in agricultural chemistry, and um, did a lot of uh, research that um, pointed pointed the way towards organic uh, fertilization for or organic agriculture, which was wow. uh, critically important at the time. India was, you know, going through famine after famine and um, obviously part of the anxiety, uh, the work of, of creating a nation is not only just how do you govern the country, but how do you feed it mm -hmm. um, in a country that that's that large, that's agriculturally based, it was a really big deal. So he was a, a pretty important guy and he was the first Indian to be the director of this agricultural wow. agency. Um, and then he also kind of lost, <laughs> lost his, his, his arguments um, mm -hmm. because that was, that preceded the green revolution, which brought all these, you know, chemical fertilizers into the country. Um, so it's, I call it, I call it the loser's history of India. Um, it's my, <laughs> it's about, you know, the, the, the ideas that don't get um, picked up 
by popular movements right. um, and all the different ways that, you know, that a country can be made and move forward. Now, are these two books, are these, how are you, how, how do you see these two books? You're writing them both at the same time? No, no, I, I wrote, I wrote the, I wrote the nonfiction book um, quite a while ago. I think and, oh. um, I, I finished it and I started, what's that? I was just wondering if one influenced the other or, you know. And, oh yeah, well, I did like about 20 years of research for the first one. And um, I was getting ready to, I was starting to query it. I was sending it, um, query letters out to agents, starting to send the manuscript out. And right when I started to do that, the pandemic hit and suddenly my two small children who I had finally had enough childcare that I could actually focus on the work of selling a book were suddenly at home with me and I was homeschooling them. And um, I was a tad resentful. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's where the idea of the novel came from. And I came, I started writing that because it was a little bit um, more fun and easy to write that sort of in the quiet moments um, between taking care of two little children. Um, and uh, specifically it's that, that the, the resentment and anxieties of being a mother and never being able to get away from your children. <laughs> and, I, and is that going into your book as well? <laughs> The, the resentments, <laughs> yeah. yeah, very, very much so. Um, but also but it, the history, a lot mother, of the history. something more than be a mother. What's and that? The, I said, that is a real challenge. I mean, for a mother to be a mother and more than a mother at the same time. I mean, yeah. children can be very full-time. Yes, very, very full-time, especially when they're little, especially when they're little. And um, yeah, it's, it's a lot, it's still, um, you know, and if you are, if you are not a nine to fiver, I think also, um, in addition to, to being a mother, if you are trying to uh, freelance or make art or do something that's kind of non-traditional, um, that where you don't have like a door you can close and say, okay, mom is at work now. And then you open the door and say, okay, I'm back in present in my domestic life. Um, it is, it is particularly challenging. It must be. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating. I can't wait to read your book. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm looking, I can't wait to read yours too. It sounds really fascinating. Well, it's, it's, it's not too long. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious, do, have you had any of your former patients, um, you know, find the book, reach out to you? First of all, we never call them patients. We, we call them clients because we do, really don't want to have a kind of illness connotation. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I think probably some have, although it's not a population that would read the book, but, but we are, um, but what or the people who are reading the book are actually people who are being trained to, to run these groups, mm -hmm. which is exactly right. And, and that's, that's the, that's the best audience. So I'm trying to get it into social work schools and, and therapy therapy programs because it, it it goes very well with students who are, you know, trying to get their masters or, or PhDs and and because it talks about, you know, interventions and um and diagnoses and stuff like that, but but not from such a pathological perspective. I mean, we we really see trauma is very deep. Mm -hmm and societal uh, effects on certain populations are incredible. Um, so, and most, of, and most of our clients are poor, many of them are minority. Um, we also have pro programs in Venezuela and, and Argentina and Burundi and South Africa. So we're spreading around a bit, but it's, it, it works pretty well with all of them, actually. And um, and I think having fun sounds like a strange thing to say, but if you can work and have fun, have fun yourself and have fun with your clients and have and let them have fun, a lot more comes out. So that's mm -hmm. these, some of these interventions really are designed for people to have a good time while they're doing it. So one, one, another one, for instance, is, is secrets and fears. Now this is further along in the process. This is like session seven or something. 
but we give everybody a little piece of paper, post two post-its, and we ask them to write on one a fear that they have, and the other one a secret that they've never told anybody before, and then to, to fold it all up very tightly and then put it under their feet and walk around the room without showing it to anybody. So, so this, you know, people, people are laughing and they're bunk, bumping into each other and they're losing their papers and whatever. And after all of that, now those are serious questions, right? We, we then get into a circle and then they, and then we decide how they decide how they're going to destroy their secrets and fears. They're going to get rid of them. So sometimes they burn them up. Sometimes they flush them down the toilet, whatever. And then after all of that, we come back and this and say, does anybody want to say what was on their secret or fear on their paper? And this is a place where not infrequently people confess terrible sex crimes against them and really awful things that have happened to them that they have never told anybody before. But it kind of it, this this kind of working working up to it in this way gets around the defenses and helps people really open up. And my book is called Opening Up, actually, uh, which is the name that the Burundians have given to it. Um, it's called Twigarure in, in Kurundi, but they, it translates into opening up. And I thought that was just the perfect, mm. you know, perfect name for it because it helps people open up and share their and they share their secrets, they share their lives in a way that they're not blamed and they don't get diagnosed. And, um, and then, you know, we try different alternatives, different things they can try to change their life. So that, that's how it works, basically. That's a great, that's great. That um, reminds me that, and what you were saying about the buttons earlier too, reminds me in a lot of ways about, um, I think, the, common tool in our writer's tool kit, or even in actors is uh, rather than having a character, you don't ever want a character saying something directly because the character doesn't have people speak, you give them something else to, to bounce off of, right? You give them like something to react to. Um, and uh, that thing can be as silly and goofy as, as as you can make it, and that character is always going to have a very particular reaction based on their history. It's really, it's, it's really fun, and the family sculptures. Not, we used to do. It's, I mean, it's a little. It's we have to now upgrade it, up, change it. But we used to do the Bush family. We used to in in our trainings, training people to run this. We would enroll the the, the George Bush family, and make a sculpture out of them, and it was hilarious. You know. <laughs> <laughs> everybody, everybody had such a good time doing it, and the, and there's real meaning in it inside. But it, you know, it, it just is a way of getting inside a family very quickly. Mm. And, like a this a common, a common, a common, a shared project, right? Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And you can see what these. I mean, th this was not an easy family, Billy's family. But they got right into it. I, when I, as soon as I said they were artists, you know, it like it changed the, it changed the feeling, you know. Oh, we're not the sicko family that's with a therapist who's going to tell us how bad we are, you know. They were going to have fun playing and being artists, and they were, you know, I mean, it's it's a much long, it takes much longer than the way I described it in the book because I had to close it, make it shorter. But, but they go into great detail, and you know, and and the and the expressions are so funny and then they and then sometimes they say words when when they're you know in a particular position and then say well now now say a word about wh where you are right now and then and then they'll say a word about what they're feeling and but they learn so much about each other and themselves by seeing this sort of graphic graphic picture mm. so Anyway, we have a good time doing it. How are we doing on time? You're, you're just so magical when it came to that because it was perfect time for me to show <laughs> up. And I've just so enjoyed your conversation. It's, I've learned so much. We actually had someone in the chats, uh, Laura Tucker, who is on our last episode of Write America, 
say oh. that she was trained to be a facilitator of parenting journey. No kidding. Oh my God. And how much she loved doing the work. Once I was trained in parenting awesome. journey, I have good in memories of my interactions with families as a family intervention, social worker. How fantastic. That's lovely. So it was great. I mean, that's serendipity. <laughs> that's good. Well, we, we pass it around and keep it going. <laughs> um, I, as we wind up our time, I'd like to know what you are reading these days because we are a bookstore and we're going to bring it home to oh, yeah. uh, what we inquiring minds want to know, know what's on your bookshelf. Either one I, of you. I'm starting off the year uh, reading um, a lot of Ursula K. Le Guin, um, who I long Wait. admired. What Ursula, Ursula, Qua Ursula K. Le Guin. Okay. Most famous for the Earthsea trilogy and for what you're reading now, I think. Um, the I forgot the name of the cycle, but it includes Left Hand of Darkness, which is one of her most famous works, mm -hmm. uh, and The Dispossessed. Um, but I'm right now I'm reading some of the earlier, some of the earlier ones. Um, uh, she's a she's a, a very well known science fiction writer, um, and um, she uh, died not not terribly long ago. Right. Um, but she was writing mostly, um, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s. And um, her writing was really, um, she, was, she was just really, she had like, uh, she was writing things that feel now very, very fresh in terms of the subject matters that she's writing. She was writing about gender and she was writing about um, um, uh, imperialism and she was writing about race in ways that really um you know forefronted our kind of national conversation now um unlike so many writers from that time who now feel very like old and musty um it feels like almost like she was she was like light years ahead um so well, I, I was in i was in high school and college in the 70s and i remember reading her voraciously yeah uh, and it was just, I felt like I was getting away with something. I loved her work. I loved her work. <laughs> yeah, she's an, she's an incredible writer. So yeah. I'm starting, I, I was like, I'm going to, I don't know if I can be a completist because she was really prolific, but I want to try to get through as much as I can. Um, and so I'm starting uh, with those books. And so I, I, I've read uh, so far this year, I've read uh, Rokanan's World and Planet mm -hmm. of Exile, which are two of her, 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 her very first novels. Um, and it's just great. It's great as a as a writer to read a, a great writer writing at the beginning of her career, uh, where her all her talent is still there, her ideas are there, but they haven't blossomed into the great genius yet. Um, there's something just really wonderful about reading those early works. So yeah, I'm enjoying that a lot. I envy you. That sounds like so much fun. <laughs> it's great. So and I, what are you up to? I, well, I finished recently the Elsa Morante um, four four novels. Oh Elsa. God, Alana Ferrante, the Alana Ferrante, friends. yeah, yeah, Elsa, Elsa Ferrante. And recently, I just finished um, Herman Diaz's Trust. Now, that's not a book I would have picked myself, but I was on a trip with my children, and my and I ran out of things to read, and my daughter had brought it to, for her to for herself to read and I read it and I mean I wasn't interested in it because it was all about Wall Street and how boring I thought that was but it's I don't know whether you've read it or not but it is it's fascinating how how this book is written well it was interesting because we got in copies for the holidays obviously and people bought them and they gave them to other people and there's not often that people will come back to my bookstore and say I really love that book by the way I mean, just to drop in to give me feedback, this is one of them. Yeah. I was so surprised because I, I don't I, get much chance to read in the fourth quarter for obvious reasons. So it's on my nightstand to- Well, it's, to you know, I mean, at first I thought, oh God, do I have to hear more about Wall Street, Wall Street, Wall Street. <laughs> <laughs> but then the way it turns, it, it, it has this turn twist to it. And, in, and, and the way it ends, I mean, it's brilliant. I don't know. And, I mean, Herman Diaz, I've never heard of him. I don't know him, but he wrote it. And he certainly had, he certainly has, 
he has the upper class in the 1920s down pat and just just rolls with this thing and it's 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 amazing it, it is truly amazing well we all learn something from what you all are reading because everybody you know there are things that none of us have thought about before in terms mm -hmm. of you know what to reread and and i'm yeah. rereading a book right now which i really love but um no, thank you for, and thank you for tonight. And thank you for sharing your work. And the conversation was just fascinating and rich for all of us. So it is time to sign off. I hate to say it. Um, I'm going to mute you and say good night to everyone here. I'd like to thank Priya and Anne for sharing their work and their thoughts to everyone who tuned in tonight. And thank you to Roger Rosenblatt for creating this original and important series. I bid you good night until next Tuesday, January 24th, as we welcome Carl Phillips, Gail Mazur, and Adam Gopnik. Please remember to check out Bird's Books Write America page where you can find out information about our upcoming episodes and maybe purchase a book or two. Thank you so much. Have a good evening.